I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation. That was quite a monumental speech back in 1961, and influential, I'm sure, to the world of science fiction writing. To understand the mechanics and philosophy behind the legend of Star Trek, let's do a little time traveling to examine the origins of man's unquenchable desire to understand the heavens. Since early man first looked up into the night sky with curiosity, we've dreamt of venturing high into the heavens, beyond the confines of our own planet, towards those little campfires blazing in the vast unknowns of space. While astronomers theorized about the origins of the universe, our imaginations pondered the existence of life on other planets, and what type of vehicle could transport us there. The prophetic Jules Verne wrote an amazing tale about three men, a dog, and a couple of chickens blasting off from, amazingly enough, the Florida coast. Five seconds. Four, three, two, one, zero. Then a slew of writers and filmmakers painted frightening pictures of alien encounters and outer space conquests that would influence our thinking for generations. That's the end of everything. What do you mean? You got company. Gee whiz. Then in 1957, the launching of the first man-made satellite, the Soviet Sputnik 1, initiated the dawn of the space age. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. The U.S. rose to the challenge with a continuous series of its own historic voyages, including John Glenn's orbit around the Earth aboard the Friendship 7. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Which brings us to 1965, a year that would record another significant milestone in outer space history, the first U.S. walk in space. But it was also a year in which science fiction blended with science fact. A bold new visionary sprang onto the scene in the world of television, a man who would forever alter the way we think about outer space. His name, Gene Roddenberry. Gene spearheaded a brave new idea, a series that would explore the human condition within a space-age format. Treat everyone on board like a human being except yourself. And now you're tired and you... You bet I'm tired. You bet. I'm tired of being responsible for 203 lives. and I'm tired of deciding which mission is too risky and which isn't, and who's going on the landing party and who doesn't, and who lives. But who dies? Roddenberry produced a pilot episode entitled The Cage, which starred Jeffrey Hunter and a very young Leonard Nimoy. At first, the executives at NBC Studios rejected the show for being too cerebral. They felt I had offered them a wagon train to the stars, which I had, because I wanted to sell it. And westerns were very big at the time. And uh, they felt that I'd double-crossed them. I'd read them this, written them this thing about uh, um, where the mind went in, in certain ways, and they wanted someone with bare knuckles and a fist fight. Who was this brash writer-producer who would deceive the network and challenge their perceptions of quality television? What was his background? Well, in the beginning, Gene Roddenberry was simply a navigator, and a courageous one at that. In World War II, he flew a total of 89 daredevil missions over the South Pacific and was awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross. As a troubleshooter for Pan American Airways, he led a critical rescue operation which saved many lives and earned him a Civil Aeronautics Commendation. But Gene would hang up his wings to pursue something he felt was much more fascinating. He saw a strange glowing box known as television, and he wanted to write for it. Eventually, he began selling scripts to such hit series as Dragnet and Have Gun Will Travel. But Gene was eager to break new ground. When he began developing Star Trek, he was hoping he could show viewers an optimistic view of the future. Little did he know how much that optimism rubbed off on the executives at NBC. Because for the first time in the history of network television, 
they commissioned a second Star Trek pilot. We made him a second show, which had uh, a lot of science fiction elements too, but at least it ended up with uh, uh, Bill Shatner in a bare knuckle fist fight, in which he beats a godlike figure. That started us, we sold Star Trek with it. There were plenty of cast changes made for that second pilot, and Roddenberry had to put up a fight to keep one character on board the Enterprise intact. I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. With Mr. Spock and myself in tow, Roddenberry created an unprecedented mix of culture and race working alongside each other in the future. Thankfully, the network saw something exciting and unique. As a result, NBC decided to go where no man has gone before and premiered their first historic episode on September 8th, 1966. Set your phaser on one quarter. I'll leave mine on stun. Let's get him. Captain Kirk is Captain Hornblower of the of uh, the sailing ships, who was a great hero, and Hemingway said is the uh, most exciting uh, uh, adventure fiction in the human language. Captain, we're getting a signal from the spacecraft. I, I was pleased that uh, in those days, when uh, you couldn't get even blacks on television, that I not only had a black but a black woman and a black officer. Sir, contact with an object. It's moving toward us. No visual contact yet. Great affection I have for Asians and what they do and the important part they play in the world. And I just, I just could not have a, a group of Earth people without including that great, you know, one half or more of, of the Earth continents. How close will we come to the nearest Klingon outpost if we continue on our present course? Ah, one parsec, sir. Close enough to smell them. Chekhov came on the show because I'd read something and uh, someone had sent me a copy of a Russian newspaper in which they said after our first year, oh, the ugly Americans are at it again. We were the first people in space, and then, but the Americans don't even have a Russian aboard this crew. Why, that power leak has unbalanced the ship and she's starting to drift. I can't hold her in place that long. Scots have always been shipbuilders and ship engineers and so on, and that was a bow to tr tradition. Your pulse is 242. Your blood pressure is practically non-existent. Assuming you call that green stuff in your veins blood. The readings are perfectly normal for me, doctor. Thank you. And as for my anatomy being different from yours, I am delighted. Somehow or another, that when that episode showed, why, the fans picked up on it. And the writers, as a result, went to work. And then they began to build this kind of a relationship. And it, through the years, it just became more popular and more popular, and the fan mail began to, to demand it. Star Trek was always in danger of cancellation, especially during the initial months of its first season. Loyal viewers across the country sent letters, phoned their local stations, and eventually convinced the sponsors to keep Star Trek alive for another season. They're the ones that really gave us this longevity. It's their belief, it's their faith, it's their tenacity, it's their energy reserve, it's their um, endlessly creative, inventive ways in, in, uh, of lobbying that gave uh, Star Trek this life. Star Trek repeatedly broke new ground with its futuristic portrayal of life in outer space. And the constant effort to make quality television won Roddenberry an Emmy Award and respect among the scientific community. But despite the unheard of mail campaigns from dedicated fans, the series made its final voyage on June 3rd, 1969, after a total of 79 episodes. Dr. McCoy, your report. We were too late, Jim. There's nothing could be done. Captain Kirk, out. 